Hi everyone, my name is Cheryl Hoffman and I'm from the Department of Interventional Radiology. I'm very pleased to be with you today to talk about minimally invasive relief for painful back fractures. I personally work out of the Manhattan Beach UCLA radiology facility as well as the UCLA Santa Monica Hospital, but these procedures are practiced both at Westwood, Santa Monica, and we see people in clinic, of course, in Manhattan Beach as well. So let's get started. You can ask all your questions on Twitter or make a post on Facebook, as is noted here. And at the end, we will answer the questions. So relief for painful back fractures. The most important thing I want you to remember today is you do not have to suffer. That of course we want you to try conservative things if you have a back fracture. Try medications and resting for a period of time. But if pain continues, please know that there is a minimally invasive procedure which I will show you in detail today that can relieve your pain. So let's talk about back fractures. They are extremely painful. They are life changing. I see patients in my office all the time who were active, playing golf, walking, doing housework, living their life, and when they get a painful back fracture, it all changes. They can no longer move at the same rate. Their mobility decreases. They may have to take pain medication, which can make them cloudy in their thought and not as active. So you can have this decreased movement the back is a very central portion, obviously, to the body. And when you have back pain, it affects everything. And if you have to take opioid pain medication, you can become constipated, have cloudy thinking, and less energy, as well as a million other side effects. So as you know, nationally, we're working to get patients away from opioid medications. And this procedure will help get patients off the opioid medications as well. So minimally invasive relief, yes. We don't have to do a big back surgery. In fact, this is an outpatient procedure. Patients come in off all blood thinning medications because we will have to be poking and poking in, you know, through skin, muscle, and bone. So we don't want patients on aspirin or Plavix or any of these blood thinning medications. But then after one to two hours of the procedure, patients are able to go home just a couple hours later. So it's not something that requires hospitalization, which is great. We put cement into the fractured bone. That's the crux of the procedure. Now we can use a balloon or not use a balloon. We can use radiofrequency ablation or not. But what really helps the pain is the cement which is placed into the fractured bone. I had a patient yesterday who was asking me, details about which one, vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty. And I said, let's keep it simple. Let's first decide if you just need the procedure. And then if you do, that's where we're the specialists. And we look at all the literature and we figure out what will be best for you and how we can best get the cement into the fractured bone. That is what is most important. Now, what does that cement do? I must admit, we don't understand it fully. But a couple things that cement will do is to stabilize the fracture. Just like when you broke, break your arm. You put your arm in a cast, right, until the bone heals so the bone fragments aren't moving around. Well, the cement does the same thing to the fracture fragments in the back so that things are not moving around. Later in the talk, I'll show you one case of a poor gentleman. When he stood up, his bone was very flat, and when he laid back, the bone would open like this. Well, can you imagine having a bone that was doing this all the time? That would hurt a lot. So we stabilize the fracture with the cement. Also, the cement can become pretty hot. And maybe that kills the nerve roots inside that bone where there is some pain. The ligaments that run ac across the outside of the bone may become more stable too because they're not bending as the fracture is bending. So. As I stated, we don't understand it fully, but these are a couple good mechanisms which we believe do help to decrease the pain. Now, 
I'm calling this talk painful back fractures because that's pretty simple. That's what we understand. The procedures are called kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty or vertebral augmentation. We augment that vertebral body so that it no longer moves and the fracture becomes more stable. So it's minimally invasive because we don't make large incisions or have to sew anything up. We literally poke, which is easy. And when we pull out, we hold pressure. That's about it. It's outpatient. It's approximately one hour per level. We usually do whatever's required, which is most of the time one or two levels. If patients have four levels, we may have to do the procedure at two different settings so that we can cover the, all of them. But on occasion, if there's small vertebral bodies, we'll do more levels. But typically, one or two levels are the problem and are causing the pain, and that's how many we treat. We usually use anesthesia, call it MAC anesthesia. If any of you have had a colonoscopy, you know what that's like. You know, an IV, the white stuff, propofol, and our wonderful anesthesiologists help keep our patients very, very comfortable so that we can complete the procedure. Sometimes we just use Versed and fentanyl, what we call moderate sedation, but MAC anesthesia, if possible, is most common. The pain relief is immediate. Our nurses are so surprised. Patients can barely sometimes get on the table, and when we're done and we wake them up, they move so much more freely. It is immediate. As I like to say, the deep pain is gone, but the superficial pain, the new pain where I poked you, is there. And that new pain usually goes away over a week or two. Sometimes it's hard for people to tell the difference, but for many, they know that that old, deep, horrible pain that they've been suffering with is gone and that this new pain will quickly go away over a week or two. And similarly, then the pain medicine that they've been taking can go down as well, and the activity level can rise, and patients can start doing more of their normal activities. So the old bone fracture pain is gone, and the new temporary skin and muscle tenderness where we enter um, is present just for one to two weeks. So what causes these back fractures? How does this happen? Well, of course, there's trauma, but that is very rare and not really the, the common cause and not really what I see mostly. We primarily see osteoporotic compression fractures, weak bone, and I'll show you a picture of that, and that's what's most common. So it can be a simple sneeze or a sit down at the table on a hard chair or sometimes a fall, and the bone can fracture, and this can cause a lot of pain. Alternatively, we can have cancer in the bone. Now, some cancers, like renal cell cancer, thyroid cancer, some of the lytic cancers where they kind of moth-eaten, the, the cancer isn't tough and hard like in prostate cancer. It's, it's a little more soft. It makes the bones very soft, myeloma in particular. The bones become soft, and with the soft bone, with the softness uh of the bone now, there'll be a fracture. And so we will treat with radiofrequency ablation. We will heat the tumor and kill the tumor and then put in the cement. And the cement is really what helps tremendously. So look how common vertebral body compression fractures in the USA this year, 700,000. It's dramatic. And around the world, well over a million. It's common. 90% are secondary to osteoporosis, and 10% are secondary to cancer. So osteoporotic fractures of the back are much more common than cancer, but they both ca cause fractures and pain. Now this may surprise you. If I were to say to you, I'll close this here, I'll, I'll cover it. But if I were to say to you, what's the number one fracture site for people who have osteoporosis, what would you say? And most people say the hip, maybe the forearm, but the answer is the spine. The spine is the number one site for osteoporotic compression fractures. So though many will heal, another fracture, uh, portion of those fractures remain very painful and patients see a decreased quality of life. Those are the patients we want to treat so that we can 
improve their quality of life again. So this, I thought, was a nice picture showing what happens when you have normal bone, sort of like a dense sponge, if you will, a, a sponge like you use in your kitchen that would take up um, water. And this is osteoporotic bone. I like it to think of it more like the sea sponge, right? You know, where it's just bigger holes, bigger bubbles, more like Swiss cheese rather than a dense cheese. And so you can see how there's very few trabecula, we call it, in the bone. And with very few trabecula, you can see how it's more prone to fracture. It's more delicate and can fracture more easily. So traditional medical treatment for these osteoporotic fractures are analgesics, the Advil's, ibuprofens, you know, medicines, Tylenol, that will help with the discomfort. Bed rest, bracing, wearing a, a brace, and medications, bis bisphosphonates. Th you know, there's a, there's a whole group of conservative treatments that work for a percentage of the fractures, and they heal. And then patients can go about their normal life. But for the people for whom these are not enough, and, and in fact the analgesics aren't enough, and they're losing muscle because they're at bed rest, and they hate the brace because it's so uncomfortable, these are the patients that we should treat with the procedure of vertebral augmentation. How about cancer, malignant fractures? That could be a metastatic lesion, like I was sharing with you, from breast, renal cancer, thyroid cancer, or myeloma. Well, they're treated typically with, again, the analgesics, bed rest, bracing, bisphosphonates, opioid medications, as well as radiation therapy and chemotherapy. What happens when you have one fracture? Does your risk of having a second fracture go up? It does. So the risk of having a second fracture after a first fracture is five times after your first fracture and 12 times after your second fracture. So unfortunately, if you have one, you do have to worry that you may get more. So it's very important that you take medications and things to improve the integrity of your bones. So how do we figure out if you have a painful back fracture that we can treat? What do we do? Well, first, we do a physical exam. We hear, did something happen? Did you fall? Did you sneeze? When did it happen? And what have you tried to make it better? Has physical therapy helped? Has the medication milk? Has bracing, bed rest? All these things helped or not? We want, we don't want you to have pain, but we require patients to have a certain level of pain before it's reasonable to do a procedure. So on a zero to 10 scale, pain should be over four. To, to justify, if you will, us getting involved in doing a procedure. That, that's important. So we want to know if there's pain, how much pain there is, and does it correspond to the fracture site? You can see over here, I've shown you a picture of what that b fractured bone will look like. How do we see what the bone looks like? We take an x-ray. We may do an MRI. We want to see if there's edema in that bone and get a 3D look at what the bone is doing. Is it pushing on a nerve root? Is it, has it moved at all? The MRI is essential. Now, if you can't get an MRI, we may do a bone scan or a CT. And who can't get an MRI? Usually it's someone with a pacemaker, although now at UCLA we do have some MRI machines that are compatible with pacemakers. We do certain things to do an MRI, even if you have a pacemaker. But that being said, these are the tests that we do to see how your fracture is doing, and indeed, if it's a subacute fracture, something that is really causing the, the pain that you may have, and then we go ahead and figure out what is best for you. So who's a candidate for this procedure? Vertebral augmentation, also known as kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. Who's a candidate? Well, pain level should be greater to or equal than to four on a zero to 10 scale. You should be unable to really do your physical activities, not tolerating the opioid medications for the reasons I described previously. We have to make sure the pain is in the same location as the fracture. There should be edema in that bone, right? You know what edema is, it's fluid, swelling. That means that it's active and it probably is the source of pain. 
The vertebral body typically that we're looking for is decreased in height and there's deformity. Bottom line is pain and failing conservative treatment. If that's the case, you're a candidate for vertebral body augmentation. Where do they tend to occur? They tend to occur at the T7-8 level or the T12-L1 level, as I've outlined for you here, but they really can occur anywhere, particularly throughout the thoracic and lumbar spine. They have different shapes. Some are wedge-shaped, that's number one. Some are biconcave, and others are crush, just sort of symmetrically down. So here's a nice example. Here's an x-ray, and we're showing the narrowing of the vertebral body. And on the MRI, you can see that the vertebral body here is smaller, more flat, and there's white in it or edema in it. So I can see that that is a subacute fracture, and if that's the cause of pain, we have a solution. Now you don't want to wait too long if you're having persistent pain and none of the conservative measures are, are helping because this vertebral body can become more and more flat as we go and that becomes harder for us to treat and harder for us to relieve the discomfort. These are the tools we use. Again, as I shared with you, we use needles, we use balloons to go into the vertebral body and sometimes we use radio frequency type devices, heating devices to ablate the tumor prior to putting in the cement. But if conservative measures fail, treat. We angle, so we go directly through the bone into that vertebral body. As you can see here, we blow up the balloon if we're gonna do a kyphoplasty, which I do most frequently, and we put in some cement. So it fills the vertebral body, and this is what we're looking for a vertebral body that has n been nicely filled with the cement so that we will stabilize the fracture and get the most pain relief. Here's a nice example. You can see the MRI and you can see this vertebral body here, which is white, unlike the others, which are dark. It's also flat and it's flattened here and flattened here. We come in with our needle to the vertebral body. Again, you can see that's flattened and we put in cement, like so. Here's another one. This poor person had a vertebral body that became very flat. It gets very hard to do. And we can't make it back to normal when it gets that flat. We've come in here through the pedicle into the vertebral body. You can see here, we've blown up our balloon and we've put in some cement. And this patient had a dramatic improvement in their pain. How about this one? This is a patient who has numerous vertebral bodies. You see how a normal vertebral body should look like this? A square with white bone marrow. Here are some old ones that have healed nicely. They're still white. But these down here, where the number one is, do you see that? See how flat it's become and how dark it's become? It's become dark versus this one, flat and dark. That's because there's fluid in it and the vertebral body has a fracture. Down here, it's a little more white. So similarly, we identified the pedicle and the bony landmarks so we can safely go into that vertebral body and we fill the vertebral body with cement. This patient had complete relief of her pain. Here, we just have two adjacent vertebral body fractures. See how nice the vertebral bodies are at the other levels? Square, dark. This is an x-ray, that's an MRI. But down below in this area, you can see how they've both become white and flattened. So we go through the bone into the vertebral body, right here, and we put in a balloon, blow it up nicely, and we add cement. Now this is the patient I was talking about with you. This poor person had not only had to leave their home, they were in a nursing home and for over four months they were on pain medication trying to figure out how to control their pain. And what happened was they had a terrible fracture. It was so bad it basically kept doing this the whole time. So we went in, this was not cancer, this was just osteoporosis, and we filled the fracture with cement. This person got out of his wheelchair, out of the nursing home, 
and went back to normal life. Really, these, these procedures are extremely gratifying to people like me, to physicians that do them. We really change a life. So here you can see the nice cement in the vertebral bodies. And again, the cement has done great. So what if you have cancer? We were talking about that before. It's the same basic procedure as what I showed. The difference is we will use radiofrequency ablation, a heating mechanism. Some are, they have all different names. But basically, we have to heat tissue. Sometimes you can freeze tissue, but that's not, not as common in the spine. But you know, we do techniques that are thermal to destroy tissue that's grown into the bone so that we can make a space and put cement in the bone to stabilize it, heat it, and get the pain to improve. So for focal pain in these lytic metastases and myeloma lesions, this works very well. So if patients in particular have radio-resistant tumors, you know, x-ray therapy, radiation therapy will not help, this is a choice. This is a wonderful option. How about if they've had radiation therapy, but they still have pain? This is a wonderful choice. And what about patients who have reached their maximum radiation dose to the spine? This is a wonderful choice. So this procedure also can be done with radiation therapy because radiation therapy can take two weeks for improvement in the discomfort, and this is immediate. So they're really complementary procedures and certainly can be done if radiation therapy can't be done. So after treatment, what can we expect? We can expect less pain. We can expect enhanced quality of life. We can expect more mobility, a faster discharge if, hospitals, if hospitalized, and less coming back to the hospital because the pain just hasn't gone away. So hopefully we've explained minimally invasive relief for painful back fractures. And now I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. OK, so painful back fractures. Is vertebral augmentation for back fractures or kyphoplasty covered by insurance? Yes, it is, fortunately. I've been doing this for many, many years. And knock on wood, <laughs> I've never had a denial. I've never had to have a serious conversation with the insurance company to get approval. And I've never had. Uh, a patient who has um, insurance have to pay cash. So yes, they are typically covered by insurance. Remember, if we can get you out of the hospital sooner, if we can get you off, off the opioid medications, I mean, there's so much benefit, and the insurance companies know that. If I go to the hospital because the pain is so bad, will they do a kyphoplasty before I go home? Well, I would hope so. Because, yes, you failed conservative measures. You know, once you're in the hospital, that's pretty serious, right? Most people in their lifetime hopefully don't go to the hospital unless they have something very serious. We're trying to keep everybody at home as much as possible. So the goal is to get you home and back to your regular life. So being in the hospital does count as failing conservative measures. And um, a kyphoplasty or vertebral augmentation is a very good idea. And if that occurs, we can get you out of the hospital much sooner. What if I have a back fracture that hurts, but also leg pain? Can you do anything for my leg pain too? Yes, yeah, sometimes when these fractures occur, they can push on nerves. So by stabilizing the fracture, the fracture won't continue to flatten and push more on the nerve. That's the good news. So we would do a vertebral augmentation, a kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty. And then what about that poor nerve that's getting squashed? Well, we can go in with a little needle and do an epidural injection with steroid and lidocaine and numb that nerve and hopefully decrease the inflammation. And if the inflammation is down, and then maybe the nerve will become less pissed off and stop 
hurting. So yes, there are more things we can do to help with the leg pain. Is there anything I can do to strengthen my bones so this doesn't happen again? Yes, we always recommend that you take medication that will strengthen the bones. And primary care physicians and specialists such as rheumatologists and endocrine specialists, etc., are experts at the latest and greatest medications for osteoporosis. So we are always certain that our patients who come to us for this procedure are being treated in a team that can help strengthen the bones to try and decrease the risk. As I shared with you, there's a five times or a 12 times incidence after one or two fractures of, of having a repeat. So we do want to try and strengthen the bones, not only by improving diet and exercise and some of these other things, but by medications as well. What is the chance it'll happen again? Well, as I shared with you, um, after one or two fractures, the incidence does increase dramatically. So we, um, we want to strengthen the bones and then also tell you to just be so careful. Let's say it was a fall. You know, let's say you're, I've had some patients just doing their housework, lifting the bed. Well, maybe someone can help you lift the bed so you don't do that again. You know, just learning that your bones are fragile and trying to not do certain activities that contribute would be a really good idea. Okay, thank you. So now we've concluded the questions, so I just want to share with you again. My name is Cheryl Hoffman. I'm a professor here of interventional radiology at UCLA. You can find me in Manhattan Beach and in Santa Monica. I have other colleagues that do these procedures as well. So we perform currently in Westwood and Santa Monica these procedures, and we see patients in clinics such as Manhattan Beach, our clinics are growing, Santa Clarita is coming, Palos Verdes is coming, UCLA is expanding, and so we will we'll be trying to bring these procedures and the clinic visits close to you. Thank you very much. Here are the numbers you can call, or of course there's email. Thank you very much.